Um, hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us this evening for this virtual event. Um, my name is Brian Ganter, and I am the Assistant Program Manager at the Center for Creative Photography. All month long, we've been celebrating family photographs on our social media uh, social media accounts, including Instagram and Facebook. And tonight, my, my colleague, Dana Hemingway, will discuss the properties of several photographic print types found in family albums, as well as how to take care of the photographs in your family's collection. Um, tonight's lecture will be followed up with another live virtual event on Wednesday, August 5th from 4 to 5 p.m. Pacific time. Tricia Patterson, uh, a digital, um, digital preservation analyst at Harvard Library, will join us to discuss why uh, digital archiving is important for everyone how digital materials can be more at risk than physical ones and offer guidance on format, storage, and organization. Because I know we all have thousands of pictures and videos hanging out there. So please be sure to join us um, on August 5th. Registration is free and we'll be sure to place a link uh, in to that event page in the chat. Um, a little bit about the, the format tonight. Dana will lecture for the first 45 minutes. Um, this will be followed by 30 minutes of Q&A. So again, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat. Some folks have already submitted them ahead of time. Uh, we ask that you use the chat to ask your questions. And additionally, just please be sure to mute your microphone and also to select the speaker view option uh, in the upper right portion of your screen. But before I introduce Dana, I want to extend my sincerest thanks to uh, the center's members and the members of the director circle. Uh, events like this um, are, are made possible due to your generous support. So thank you so very much. Um, if you're interested in becoming a member, we'll place a link uh, in the chat uh, to our membership page. So it's my pleasure now to introduce tonight's speaker, Dana Hemingway. Uh, Dana Hemingway came to the CCP in 2017 as the Arthur J. Bell Senior Photograph Conservator, where she stewards the conservation and preservation activities for the fine print and archive collections. She is currently focused on securing low temperature storage for the center's at-risk film and color materials and is researching the condition issues seen in the photogravures of Edward Curtis. From 2003 to 2017, Hemingway worked at the Library of Congress as a senior photograph conservator, serving as conservation liaison to numerous special collection divisions. She was also responsible for evaluating and treating all photographs selected for in-house or loan exhibitions. Hemingway was an Andrew W. Mellon Fellow at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and she participated in the first cycle of the Advanced Residency Program in Photograph Conservation, co-sponsored by George Eastman Museum and the Image Permanence Institute. She graduated from Winterthur University of Delaware program in art conservation with a Master of Science degree specializing in photographic materials. She has lectured internationally to professional audiences as well as college and graduate students on conservation and preservation of photographic materials. She's a professional associate and has served as an officer of the Photographic Materials Group of America Institute for Conservation. Please join me in welcoming Dana Hemingway. Thank you, Brian. That was a mouthful, huh? <laughs> Very accomplished. <laughs> um, anyway, well, welcome everybody. It's my pleasure to be here. Um, I, I want to acknowledge as a land-grant institution, the faculty and administration at the University of Arizona and professional staff at the Center of Creative Photography acknowledge the O'odham and Pasquale Yaqui peoples who have traditionally stewarded this land. Our topic today is preserving family memories, how to care for your photographs. Um, it's one of the activities I particularly love to talk about, um, preserving photographs and in particular family photographs. I know how important they are to me and my family, so I assume perhaps they will be to you as well. This is from, from the blurb um, announcing the lecture. You've got hundreds of family photographs somewhere in your house, maybe in albums, maybe in boxes, uh, some probably just floating loose around the garage that you've been meaning to organize for years. 
So the next few slides are going to probably um, stimulate some memories. Is this familiar to you? Lots of photographs in packages, um, albums, boxes full of photographs. So I want to provide you with some information and hopefully good advice for protecting yours. And so you can hand them down um, to, excuse me, to the next generation. Each of the materials in these unique objects have their own particular needs. Learning about these factors will significantly improve preservation strategies for a collection of one or many. A presentation overview of today, I will be covering the following topics, layered structure of photographs, uh, different process types, sources of damage, things we can control, when to call a conservator, some resources, and then a section, as Brian mentioned at the end, for question and answers. What we refer to as a photograph, photographs are in fact quite varied. There are prints and negatives, transparencies, case photographs, and there are many, many different types that we call processes from the 19th century all the way up to the present day. In, this, in studying the conservation of photographs, I have learned a great deal about their physical structure and material composition. Photographs are made from a wide variety of different materials, metals, paper, organics, dyes, and plastics. What they all have in common is their physical structure. Uh, this is a cross-section, actual cross-section of a gelatin silver print um, that's highly magnified so that you can begin to get a sense of that layered structure. Is it a, it's a composite object with many layers. And I just want to point out to you, let's see if my this works. My laser pointer. Maybe? Yeah, there we go. The paper support, the silver image material, the gelatin emulsion, and over here the barita layer. So to make it easier to see and, and conceptualize, I've, I've made a schematic cross-section of a photograph. Um, from bottom to top, again, you have the support um, there's a barita layer in some photographs, not all. There's always an image material because that makes up the image that we see. And frequently there's a binder layer. Um, in essence, a photograph, as I said before, is a composite object with, with layers and very thin layers. And each layer and each material are going to respond differently to different chemical forces and physical stress. So first there's the support the material that provides a surface on which the image lies. The most common form of, of support that we're familiar with is paper. Um, however, in the early days of photography, many photographs were made on rigid supports such as sheets of iron, silver, or glass. Various plastics have been used since the 19th century to support for negatives. In this and these three samples uh, on the left hand side is a tin type. So that's a very thin sheet of metal. It's actually made of iron and not tin. Uh, in the center is a, um, a photographic print on paper. And on the right is a photographic negative on a cellulose acetate base. So different support types. Next, we can look at the binder, which is the transparent substance that holds the image material. Uh, oftentimes, it's, and most frequently, it's made of gelatin that turned out to be a very successful binder type. Um, but there's also albumin, egg whites, collodion, which is a form of cellulose nitrate. Sometimes um, photographers might have used gum arabic if they're hand making their, their prints. But not all photographs have binder layers, it's, but it's a, it's a very common thing. And finally, the image material. Uh, this is what makes up the image from dark to light. In most cases, you can't really resolve the actual image particle with the naked eye. Um, but where you see a, a dot or a spot on the, on the schematic um, drawing, those are, those are the image material particles that you wouldn't be able to see uh, with the naked eye. But where there are a high concentration of them, it, it appears very dark, sort of a uh, D-max. And if there aren't many image particles, um, then it is a lighter area. Um, and the image particles or image material can be made up of silver, uh, dyes, pigments, platinum, iron complexes, and sometimes mixtures. In this slide on the left-hand side, 
uh, you'll see a portrait of three young men. And this is a, um, the image material in this print is, is actually finely divided silver. In the center is a color photograph, perhaps from the 70s, maybe. Um, and that's made up of color dyes, three layers of dyes, which we'll talk about in a, in a bit. And the upper right hand print is a cyanotype and it's made of a complex of iron, um, an iron substance, also known as Prussian blue if you're a watercolorist. Oops, we skipped one. So there's also associated materials in talking about the different um, different types of materials used in photographs. Uh, there are um, cases in the top right hand corner. That's a, a case for a, um, an, an ambrotype. It has leather and fabric and um, brass and glass. So all a, a nice varied structure. Um, on the bottom, bottom left is a photograph album. So there's paper, there's leather, there's all other materials there as well. In the center, the portrait of the lady, uh, that's a silver image, but she has um, added colorants to her to enhance the way she appears. And also she's on a mount. Oftentimes mounts could be added to photographs to, to either strengthen them or, or to provide some additional decor decoration. And um, on the, on the, all the way on the right hand bottom side is a frame. So frames could be an integral part of the presentation of a photograph. So all of these materials really have to be considered in total um, when deciding how to preserve um, the objects as a whole. So let's get into a little bit about the different types of photographs that there are. Um, basically, they can be broken down into three types. Um, on the left are direct positives. We'll go into each of these. In the center are negatives. And on the right, there are, are prints. Direct positives, um, they are come, basically they come directly from the camera. They are what was made light sensitive at the original scene. Um, so they went into the camera, the exposure was made, um, the photograph was processed, but it's a one of a kind. There's only one of these. They are camera originals. Technically, they are negatives, but they, through a couple of different means, they're optically reversed so we can see the positive image. On the left-hand side is a daguerreotype. It's hand-colored. It's a um, metal surface, silver, gold, mercury image material on a silver-plated copper support. There's no binder. And the way you recognize them is if you move them back and forth, they act like a mirror. You can oftentimes see a reflection. Um, oops. Nope. Note that this one has been enhanced with some nice color. So the one in the center is an ambrotype, also a direct positive, a camera original, one of a kind. Um, dates of popularity about 1851 to 70. It's silver image material suspended in a collodion binder, that's the cellulose nitrate, but it's on top of a, sh a, a piece of glass. Um, and to re reverse the tonality, um, the photographer would put a piece of black paper or paint the black of the sheet, uh, sheet of glass, and that actually creates uh, what appears to be a positive print. And they're often in cases as well. And finally, on the right, there's a, it's a tintype. Um, tintypes were popular later in the, um, in the century. Again, there's silver image particles suspended in collodion, but this time on a um, piece of iron that's been painted black. So to get your black backing, they, they went ahead and just coated the iron itself black. There are can be housed in cases like we've seen with the daguerreotype and the ambrotype or sometimes in paper um, paper mats, decorated paper mats. This one it's hard to see but there are there's an embossing there. Um, sometimes they were also varnished so in some cases we are dealing with a varnish layer too. Photographic negatives uh, by necessity have to be transparent or translucent so that you can shine light through it in order to create a positive print. Um, and typically negatives are, are identified by their binder type. So we have on the left, it's a paper negative. So the support, the support here is, is actually paper. Oftentimes it's wax to increase the translucency to help um, 
um, transmit light so that you can make a positive print. Um, and glass supports um, replaced paper because they were more translucent um, and provided a very good vehicle and medium to, um, to shine light through in order to make a positive. In both of these cases, the image material is finely divided silver. <clears throat> the binder, there's no binder in the paper negative, but on the right, the binder again is collodion. <clears throat> and later on, um, gelatin began to be used to hold the silver image material. These are most common in the 19th century. Um, towards the end of the 19th, or early to the 20th century, you begin to see photographic negatives on film support, so a plastic. Um, they come, um, the one on the uh, left of the little boy is on a nitrate support. The one, the color, the, it's a colored negative, believe it or not, that looks very orange. Um, but that's a color negative on an acetate backing. And then you may recognize um, in the lower section a 35 millimeter strip of acetate film. Um, formats became very standardized. So you get 35 millimeter, two and a quarter by two and a quarter, four by five, five by seven, eight by 10 motion picture film. Um, manufacturing companies um, put out these, these various formats and it's what was available commercially. In the case of the, both the image on the left, the boy and the film strip, those are, those are made out of silver, so finely divided silver. And for the first time we're seeing a, a color negative, which is made out of color, organic color dyes. And in all cases, the binder is gelatin. So in addition to um, cased objects and um, negatives, uh, what's probably most familiar to all of us are the photographic prints. And I'll go through several categories, silver-based prints, other print types, common formats, color photography, and finally just a tad on digital prints. So as I alluded to already, there's something, excuse me, there's something called negative positive photography. So if you have a negative that was made in the camera, develop it, process it, you can you then use that to make positive prints and you can make multiples as you can see here. Um, silver print process types um, can be accomplished in two different ways. In the 19th century, generally they were accomplished by putting a light sensitive piece of paper in contact with a negative and taking it out into the sun. The action of the um, the energy from the, from the sun actually created the image that you see there after processing. And it produced a, um, a warmer tone, a brownish tone, I think you can see in the image of the little girl on the right. And the image of the little boy on the right was made, um, was printed and, made and processed in a chemical bath. So it produces, a, it's a slightly different image tone. Um, the image particle itself is a little different and reacts differently to light. But generally, you can see the warmer tone prints are 19th century, and the cooler tone prints are more 20th century. But of course, there are many exceptions, but that's the, that's that's that will help you get started. <clears throat> um, yeah. Other um, print processes, and this is certainly not an exhaustive list. I've I've chosen the cyanotype um, on the left. Um, iron complexes, as I alluded to before, and they made in, from the 19th century onwards. Mm -hmm. It's based on the light sensitivity of iron salts that have been coated directly onto a piece of paper. In this case, there's no binder, so it has a nice soft um, appearance. And this one has actually has additional colorants added to it. So it's, it's not the red you see around the edge. Um, or the, the, the hash, hash marks around, but the, the sort of the beautiful hue of the flower as well as the background. Um, it was frequently in the 20th century used for architectural drawings known as blueprints, um, but artists often use them um, to make their prints um, as well. Platinum printing on the image on the right um, was made from finely divided platinum metal. Um, in this case, the um, prints made from the late 19, very late 19th century onwards could produce um, images with a sort of a, a neutral tone, but sometimes black and brown tones. One of the distinguishing features of the platinum or palladium print 
is the is the, the, the broad, very broad tonal range. So you can see in this image many, many, many subdivisions from light to dark. And it creates a very soft and lovely appearance, I believe. Um, there's no binder, so the image layer is directly coated onto a paper support, which, which has a little bit of variation in it, and that provides a diffuse surface reflection. In, a, in addition to the uh, photographic print types that we've, we've just looked at, oftentimes if you go to um, an antique store or flea market, you might be looking through some images and you could come across something that looked like either of these two um, that look like they might be photographs, but in fact, they're not. They're both photomechanical processes. Um, and that's basically at some point in the history of that image, <clears throat> Um, it was light sensitive. It was made in, um, as a photograph, but then converted into um, um, the final print itself was made mechanically. Um, multiples were made by impressing paper onto an inked printing plate and then put through a press. It was a way to make multiples again, but a um, greater number of multiples. And here are a list of some of the common types. In addition to discussing or showing you the different process types, there are also, as I mentioned with the negatives, some photographic formats that are quite common. And in the 19th century, we've seen the case photograph. It, it's pictured here um, in, in somebody's hands to show you the, the sort of intimate nature of the case photograph itself. Um, it would close up when you're not looking at the image or open it up, <clears throat> but it's something that was often held in the hand or I think as um, Civil War um, soldiers would actually tuck them into their pockets. Um, in addition to that for um, print, the print medium, what became very, very popular in the late 19th century were things called a cabinet card <clears throat> and a carte de visite. A carte de visite is a format that almost is about the same size as a, as a um, business card, a little bigger. Um, but it was used as a calling card. You could go to your friend's house and you could leave a calling card or it was a, a common um, occurrence to trade them so that you could have pictures of all your friends and you might put those into an album. Cabinet card was a little bit bigger. Perhaps these were made to go into frames, but that's the relative size you can see there. And again, there's the brown tonality. So that's indicative more of the 19th century printing type. Uh, we also see stereo cards. I, I think uh, stereo cards can be found in, in many antique stores these days. They go into an apparatus <clears throat> that help you use the separation of your eyes. And when you, your eyes um, compensate, they come together and it gives you kind of more of a 3D look. Um, and they, um, but that's a standard format and they had to be a standard size, standard distance apart. Um, an album and in many different kinds of albums uh, that are filled with many different kinds of photographs, but that's one example. Um, and then panoramas became very popular into the 20th century. Very, very long photograph, um, popular for showing you school pictures or um, military groups, things of that sort. So um, to leave the 19th century completely, well, not completely by, behind. Um, I want to spend a few minutes talking about traditional color photography, and I use the word traditional um, to distinguish it from digital photography. I didn't used to have to do that, but now I do, um, um, which is fine. Um, but it's a, it's, a, it's a photographic print made chemically. Um, and from the early days of photography, way back when it was first developed in the 1839, um, people wanted color. They wanted to see their lives in color, you know, shown back at them. Um, and, and, and until the late 19th century, hand coloring had to, had to suffice. Um, but then um, screen plates, the most popular one, which was called, a, um, the most successful one was called an autochrome, was developed and that was popular in through the 20th century. And then once we get into the 20th century, manufacturing companies began to develop a number of other color process types um, over, over the 20th century. And you see some listed here. 
silver dye bleach, which is a sebachrome or an ilfochrome. Some of these may be familiar to you. <clears throat> Polaroid is probably familiar to you. Dye transfer may be a little less familiar, but another color process. And chromogenic photography, which is the most common. So chromogenic photography, just to give you another little slice of a little cross section there. Um, it's really schematic, but it gives you a sense of the paper support at the bottom, and then you have three um, superimposed dye levels, layers. So you have yellow, magenta, and cyan. And those are all in, you know, a tiny little, you know, sheet of paper. It's, it's actually miraculous to me how color photography does work. Um, but there you are. That's the schematic. And there's a, a copy of a, an early Kodachrome print. Um, See, the binder is gelatin, and the support could, it's typically paper, but in the case of the woman with the baby, that's on an, actually on a, a polyester support. Uh, color dyes themselves, what makes up the, 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 the different dye layers, are large, complex organic molecules. It's what gives them their ability to show up as different colors. And they really depend on that chemical structure to create the different, chem, um, the, the different colors. So as we'll see, any disruption in that disrupts the ability of those dyes to, to communicate color. And digital photography, um, basically I'm referring to here at, uh, to the prints, the hard copies that get printed. Um, they're printed from an electronic file and sent to a printer. There, there are three primary types of digital hard copies. Um, and the most common is the inkjet but you also will see dye sublimation and electrophotographic. Um, the, with inkjet in particular, you get dyes and pigments. Um, early, as you may know, early digital prints were not very stable. They were very susceptible to humidity and pollution, but the technology is, is, has changed rapidly and probably will continue to change rapidly um, and become more and more <clears throat> permanent. It is an ink on paper medium, and oftentimes, just I don't know if you're aware, but the ink, ink, um, the ink sets themselves are made or manufactured to, to complement a particular paper type, um, so that the, there is a they're meant to be used in tandem. And here is an example of an inkjet print. It's actually an iris print, uh, printed by Nash Editions. Um, quite beautiful, and. <clears throat> if you're really interested in beginning to tell the difference, you need to, to look at them under magnification. You can either see uh, an interesting um, print pattern for digital photography or with um, color photography, traditional color photography, you will see dye clouds. Um, and these days you can see quite a number of, of names for um, uh, inkjet prints, sorry. They can be called archival inkjet or iris print or gicle print or pigment print. They have a number of different names and it can be very confusing. Um, but basically all of those names and probably more, um, what they have in common is that they are inkjet prints and that's the common denominator. So that's the term that I often use. So leaving the types of photographs um, now, um, what I wanted to do was talk to you a little bit about sources of damage. You have three categories that, that um, are easy to kind of think about, conceptualize, biological attack, mechanical damage, and chemical deterioration. And this isn't going to get too intense, but I just wanted to give you the categories. So biological attack basically means um, rodent damage, as you see on the right. That's the most extreme image I've ever seen, so I had to borrow it. <clears throat> And on the left, there is an image of the bottom edge. You can see uh, some pink color and some black material, and that's mold. So mold um, and paper, uh, gelatin is very yummy to um, mold, um, and paper can be eaten by any number of, of, of individuals. So that's one thing we have to guard against for preservation. Another is mechanical damage. Physical damage that can be the result of mishandling, or uh, in the case of the image on the left, where you have a whole stack of prints that have been left nestled in amongst each other over many years, and you've got fluctuations of temperature and humidity, and eventually they just all curl up on each other. And you can see it's caused 
um, mechanical damage. There's tearing. Um, and that, yeah, that causes a lot of damage. <clears throat> also, you can see here the mounted print on the left was broken. Um, that's mechanical damage, as was the cover, cover glass on this daguerreotype on the right. So all of those are physical damage, mechanical. <clears throat> Then another, the last category is chemical deterioration, and this has the most, um, the most to talk about. Um, inherent vulnerabilities, or otherwise known as inherent vice, um, some things that are inherent to the process itself. Um, residual processing chemicals can leave a yellow stain or darkened highlights, and you see the yellow staining in the image of the sailboat in the sky. You can see some, I hope you can see some sort of orange yellow stain. On the top right, the highlights are a little darker than they should be, and that's because the print wasn't processed properly. And on the lower left, I think if you look at the, the image of the building, just to, the, to our right of the, of the gentleman, you see two different image tones there. The, the browner, more neutral tone on the bottom is closer to the original color of the silver material. What's happened above that is that the uh, silver has oxidized or sulfided and become a different color. It changes color and it has less covering power, so it can both change color and lighten up. Um, and it's something we want to try to avoid and prevent from happening in the first place. But silver, as you know, tarnishes and it's very subject to oxidation. And on the bottom right, left, bottom right, yeah, on her, on our left hand side, you see a sort of a slight sheen, and that's what's called silver mirroring. It's also an oxidation process and the silver ions migrate to the surface of the print, um, interfering with the visual aspect of the photograph. Um, and that also happens from um, improper um, environment. Other, and other, other forms of chemical deterioration or inherent vulnerability are the di um, organic dye fading, as I mentioned before since there are three layers in each of those three layers of organic dyes and each of those dyes have has a different chemical composition if one is more susceptible to fading than another you'll lose you'll lose that color and in this case the magenta and probably some of the yellow still exists but there's no evidence of the cyan dye left so you get tonal shift as opposed to overall equal fading of the print you get these shifts and there are many, many slides from a certain area that look the same way. And on the, on the right is an early color photograph um, that has the yellow dye coupler that is not taken away completely. So sometimes you'll see early color prints that look overall quite yellow. But that's, not some, that's, that's inherent to the process itself. Also, um, deterioration of plastic supports. It's caused by the generation of acids and cellulosic plastic supports at room temperature, both for nitrate on the left and acetate on the right. The rate of deterioration is determined by relative humidity and temperature. And did I tell you that it happens at room temperature? So a lot of our film collections through everywhere in the world, um, if they're made on nitrate and acetate, <clears throat> will eventually deteriorate. And these are particularly bad examples. It's best to isolate those materials from others. Um, um, and really the best preservation strategy is to duplicate these materials before they get into this condition. And traditionally that was done with uh, taking another photograph of a photograph these days. <clears throat> the, the magic and wizardry of digital imaging can copy these and create really, really fine copies. But that's, that's our only recourse. Chemical deterioration also comes in the form of poor quality adhesives like rubber cement, pressure sensitive tape you can see coming down the center, and those magnetic albums. Um, we have a lot of those in my family, and I'm sure other people do as well. They're terrific because you can place the photograph wherever you want on the page, but they use um, adhesives that discolor over time. And they also cross them, which means that the adhesive becomes really strongly adhered to the back of the photograph, making them very difficult to remove. Another form of chemical deterioration is fingerprints, and I know you've all heard of this. In the image on the right, um, I believe that's the side of, a, of the hand. <clears throat> Someone has put their hand down on that print. Um, 
it didn't show up right away, but it showed up later on. So just be fair warned that this can happen, and on, particularly on silver prints, it can show up years later. So we can control a few things, right? It's not all bad news. Um, we can control the environment. Uh, we can control the storage environment, um, enclosures, exhibition, practice, and handling. The impact of the environment, um, these photographs have all blocked together because of high humidity. Um, so if we can control the environment um, um, and keep temperature and humidity uh, moder moderate, then we'll, will go a long way to uh, preserving them. And control of temperature and relative humidity really is the key. Um, high temperatures raise rates of deterioration, causing paper to become brittle and some binders to yellow. High relative humidity provides moisture necessary for harmful chemical reactions and leads to silver mirroring, which we saw image fading, physical distortion. And gelatin can swell in, in high humid cir um, circumstances. And if the print is up next to a piece of glass, you'll get it um, adhering. You'll see in the image of the lady on the left, that sort of circle around her. The outside is really nicely adhered to that glass and it's it almost impossible to get those off without damaging the photograph. Um, light is also damaging. Um, you see in the bottom left where the circle is, uh, you can get a sense of where the, the, the print was covered over um, so that the, the, the image of the two kids is, is faded. Um, in the center picture, the, the whole midsection of the print is, is yellowed. That's from light damage to paper. <clears throat> and in the image on the right, the gel uh, not gelatin, it's an albumin binder, has yellow. And you can see the actual outline of where the mat was. I, I hope you can see that. The most important thing to know about light is that it's, <clears throat> it's damaging uh, visible light as well as, and in particular, ultraviolet light, and that it's cumulative and irreversible. So limiting exposure to your family photographs or your photograph collection helps. Uh, air quality is also important. Particulates like soot, you can see in the image on the right, there was a small cleaning test um, around that area and the rest of the photograph was, was had a lot of um, soil on it. Um, dirt exists in abundance outdoors and it comes in through heating and cooling ducts and doors and windows. Um, and if your photographs are not um, housed or put into sleeves, um, they'll get dirt on them. Oxidizing gases, the image on the left, you can see again that sort of uh, uh, orangey yellowish color uh, the, around the gentleman. That's silver sulfide. That's the, the change of this particular the silver image material to silver sulfide. Um, and that happens when you've got pollutants. And pollutants come in the form of fossil fuels, combustion from car engines, ozones, um, things that will attack silver. Another key factor affecting preservation of photographs is the storage environment and, and enclosures. Um, so for, for your own personal um, collections, generally where you are comfortable, your photographs will be comfortable as well. Um, this is not, in other words, avoid uncontrolled environments, garages, attics, basements. Um, if you have a choice, the interior rooms of a house are ideal, um, not exterior walls because they, they feel the fluctuations in temperature and humidity. Uh, damage in water is devastating, so be careful not to store things directly on the floor like I do. Um, keep them about six inches off the floor and be aware of where, if you're storing things, where your water pipes might be. And if you want to display your photographs, um, just keep them away from direct sunlight. Um, here I've, I've got um, an image of a folder of, of numerous, many, 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 too many photographs in the folder. Um, to go into a box, um, an upright box. So if you separate them out and, and provide enough support, um, you, will, you, will, you will be um, helping them not to slump, not to become damaged through um, improper foldering. In this case, you see uh, um, I was presented at one point with a box like that of, of numerous photographs. And the, the best way to deal with it and, um, was to put them all in individual plastic sleeves and then put that into folders. And then you see the folders 
in the box on the right hand side. Those are all very well chemically and physically protected now. If you have both negatives and prints, it's best to separate those because they're chemically very different. And if you have acetate or nitrate, um, you want to keep those away from your prints. Paper enclosures. Here are just some of the advantages. They're easy to write on, <clears throat> generally less expensive than plastic. Um, they're opaque, which is good because it keeps out light. Disadvantages are that they're opaque, um, that you can't see what's inside of them, so you'd have to take the item out of the sleeve if you need to know what's on the inside. Um, and it increases handling. Um, but many items are very well protected in paper envelopes and sleeves. Plastic is your other option. Um, generally, we like to use polyethylene, polypropylene, or polyester, the polys, with one exception. Advantages are they're transparent. They reduce handling because they're transparent. Disadvantages are not so easy to write on. <clears throat> they, they have a static charge to them. So if you've got any vulnerability, you know, if there's any lifting binder or the paper is separating, the static charge may be damaging. And it prolonged exposure at very high humidity is not a problem in Arizona, but back east, um, sometimes the gelatin binders can swell and they might stick to not just the glass that we saw before, but into the inside of the plastic enclosures. So there's an awful lot of poor quality enclosures out there, both historically and <clears throat> what we have today. Um, the presence of chemical impurities is, is basically the problem. What we want to put next to our photographs has a direct impact on their preservation. Um, and the damage to the photographs is greatest when in direct contact with harmful materials. Um, rubber cement, poor quality paper, um, pressure sensitive tapes, all of those things. You want to be careful of what you're putting in, in intimate contact with, with, your, um, with your photographs. Here's an example of uh, one of the polys, polyvinyl chloride, um, which often shower curtains are made out of, so they have um, that shower curtain-y smell. Um, but this lovely print was put into a PVC um, plastic uh, sleeve. Um, and I can think you can see the modeled effect on, on the print. And on the right, outside of the sleeve, it still has that modeled effect. So, the plasticizers in the plastic have, have exuded out and attached themselves to the print, ruining the print. So be wary of polyvinyl chloride. Um, what's helpful for those of us who don't have large um, scientific laboratories to be able to test everything uh, is that oftentimes um, manufacturing supply manufacturers will advertise that their products have passed something called the photographic activity test. Um, and it is a, it, it's a national standard. Um, it's a way to test the effectiveness of housing, it, whether something's going to stain the gelatin or fade the silver. So the red circle shows you what that looks like. Then I've looked in several different um, of, the, of the catalogs, and they, they all do it. One caveat is that the, um, the people who are supplying the raw materials to the supplier that sells you the materials don't have to really tell them if they change their formulations. So at one point, the materials did pass the photograph, the PAT test, um, but that may not be true in into the future. It's just a caveat. But know that the manufacturers of these um, so, or the supply companies really want to give you the best quality materials that they possibly can. And that's what we have to rely on. If you want to display your items, um, consider putting them in frames, frames that are sealed on the back that keep out dust and dirt. Um, like I said, avoid hanging them on exterior walls um, and place them in, into mats, good quality mats, um, and use UV filtering plexi. There are a number of ways to attach a print to a mat. Um, and these two examples show on the left, it's a paper um, photo corner. And on the right, it's a plastic photo corner. Photo corners avoid attaching anything directly to the back of the photograph, which I like a lot. Um, and you have a couple of different options. Also, you can make something on the upper left, which is called a channel. It's just a folded over piece of paper that holds everything in place until you put the window mat down. 
and then it holds it all together. On the upper right is what we call a hinge. It's, it's, we use purified wheat starch paste to attach it. Um, not, not my first choice, but often there are times when you really do need to use a, a hinge and that's attached to the back of the photograph. Um, and on the bottom is, a, is an example of something called a sink mat, um, which has, which uh, the print itself is mounted onto a cardboard. So in order to accommodate for that thickness, you build up a well on the mat itself. And that little flap, put the photograph in place and you put the flap back over and, and use the window mat to hold it all together. So there are obviously with special formats, you need special format storage and albums often are kept in boxes. This is a good idea. Cased objects can have these little flapped enclosures. Uh, many of the supply companies will also um, sell you specially made housing for um, typical photographic formats. So with display recommendations, try not to permanently exhibit the originals, rotate them if possible, um, reduce the length and intensity of the light, keep them out of direct sunlight, <clears throat> and also tr try to um, switch it up and um, maybe make copies, right? You can make a, a really lovely digital copy of something these days and put the original in storage. Um, it's just an option, consider it. So for safe handling, um, something can be in storage for years and years and years and be in great condition. And then it's brought out either for reference or for, you know, for looking at and just a, mistake in handling can damage it. And it just, it always breaks my heart when I see something like that. So safe handling is really, really important. Um, wear gloves when appropriate, nitrile or cotton, or have very, very, very clean hands. So I always say, almost always use gloves when handling photographs, but sometimes, you know, if you don't feel dexterous with them on, um, just make sure your hands are very clean. Keep your fingers off the top surface of the photograph. If you are wearing gloves, make sure they're clean. See in the lower left-hand corner, that cotton glove is particularly dirty. Switch them out, because you want to remember that fingerprints cause problems um, on the surface of photographs. Always use a support board when handling, especially for large prints, handle with two hands. Um, if you've got something folded over, use a, a, what we call a micro spatula to help fold it back. Before you go to pick something up, just take a quick look at the print. Are there any of it, are the edges look damaged? Um, is one part of it torn? Just be aware of some of the condition problems you might be encountering and, and adjust accordingly. Um, for marking photographs, um, I think if you can record desirable information, it's always good to have the information. If you can write it on the enclosures, if necessary, you can write it in the margins use a number two pencil or softer. Try to avoid exerting pressure. The image on the lower right, you can see um, there is a reflection showing you that somebody wrote on the back kind of with a heavy hand. Avoid using inks. The image on the lower left shows you the back and the front of that image where the ink actually faded the image material. So you just gotta be aware of what materials you have so you know what to do. And this, the center is a, is a nice gummed label that was licked and stuck on the back of this photograph. Um, so avoid if you can using gum or pressure sensitive tapes. Some conservator is going to have to take that off someday. So when do you call a conservator? Um, conservators can help you with a number of things. These are just a couple of examples. Um, a panorama that's rolled up can be flattened carefully. You don't want to unroll it without uh, humidifying it properly because you can crack the gelatin by unrolling it. So conservators can help you remove surface soil. Um, and you can see it makes a big difference in the appearance, but also dirt is acidic and it can cause fading and other, other problems. It can help you with mending tears. Um, the image of the boys on the right, I think you can see the tear on the right. That was from someone trying to pull it off one of those magnetic albums and it, and it tore the photograph. Binder consolidation, a little less typical, but if you've got a print that's got flaking image material and binder, that can be consolidated. And um, compensated, uh, 
cosmetic compensation. So if, if a, a print has lost a section and you want that to be returned, um, we often use watercolors or colored pencils to do that over an isolating layer so it can be um, taken off in the future if needed. Um, there is additional information that we can supply you, uh, a list of suppliers that, that are often uh, good and have good quality materials, a reference, references for further reading if you're interested, um, directions on how to find a conservator in your area should you need their services, and there's again my name and my email address. I think Brian's going to put it in the chat in case you want to copy that down. Please feel free to contact me about that, other questions, but I can provide you with those, those three items, definitely. And when circumstances permit, when we're, when we're going to be able to open up again, we hope to see you at the center. Right now, the center is closed <clears throat> and we'll be, we're not sure when it's gonna open back up again, but there's plenty to explore, exhibitions and programs and membership and events on our website. And I hope that you'll take advantage of that until the time comes that you can come see us in person. So we have um, a, a few slides that Brian provided me to, to sort of get Q&A started. Um, and this is the first one. This was an image provided by Amy Baker, one of our exhibition specialists. And I think what she was curious about or knowing, wanting to know about was what to do about that line that circumscribes the, the, two, the two people. Um, and it's hard to tell from the image exactly what's going on, but if that's a disruption in the binder, that can be consolidated. And it can also, um, if it's actually cut out of the center, then that can be mended. Um, and the white line can be inpainted, the cosmetic compensation I mentioned, to help sort of um, distract your eye from looking at that white line. So we could get that print looking um, very good again and, and hold. In, uh, to interrupt for just a second, we have a question from Becky. Um, how much does a conservator charge to say repair a photograph like this? Do you know? Well, it kind of depends on exactly what's wrong with it. And I can't tell just from the image here. Um, and conservators um, charge varying amounts uh, per hour. Um, and that depends on whether you're in New York City or Los Angeles or maybe Tucson. Um, that, that I can't speak to. Um, but I will say that it does take, it does take time. Um, it's a it's a handcraft or you know it's a it's something that's done by the hands and in order to do it properly um, and the way you might want the results to be it can take some time in addition to the actual treatment there um, the conservator will also take a look at the piece and provide you an evaluation basically a condition examination and a proposal and then talk with you about what that proposal is mm. and then provide you a cost um, cost estimate and next here is compliments of Janet Senf. It's a roll photograph. And as we've already seen, um, you want to be very careful about, especially with a print like this, which is rolled very tightly. I can tell that there's a strong circular memory there. Um, so that has to be done with controlled humidity. And that's something a conservator can do. Um, and in addition to that, what is also vulnerable, and I can't tell what kind of um, writing it is, whether it's graphite or ink, um, but one has to be very careful of that. You can see how that the writing rolls in on the image. And if you're not careful about how you're um, humidifying it, you might get some transfer. Um, but very, very, very possible to get that flattened so that you can, you can see the print again. Would you, would you ever recommend people do that themselves or they should see a conservator in this case? I would recommend a conservator. Um, I, I had a, someone me recently who showed me some pictures of they were trying it. Um, and it rolled into some water and the ink bled and then the ink got transferred to the surface of the photograph. I've never seen that before and it, it was heartbreaking. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what you have to avoid. And so I'd recommend getting a conservator to help you with that. So this wonderful photograph, you can see the pink spots on it um, are evidence of past mold. Um, and when you're dealing with mold, I would definitely call a conservator because mold can be um, a real serious health hazard. Um, it, it's not that we can so much um, remove the 
the, the staining that's that's in the paper and in the binder that's probably permanently stained but any residual mold spores need to be removed um, and I would recommend getting a conservator to help you with that it's a lovely photograph there's some creases and things but I think it's a, a lovely photograph and this is a um, a brochure, I guess from a concert. And you can see it just um, bordering the, the top of the image and the bottom, it's, it's been folded. So if, if, if the idea is to have it be flat at some point, you can use a similar method of humidification and flattening. Um, the other key with photographs is um, the flattening has to be followed, or the humidification has to be followed by flattening and kept underweight for a long period of time so that it doesn't become all um, cockled. We had one question from Marsha. Um, the backing on a treasured Polaroid print has peeled away, which is, um, I've seen it before. The image is now damaged and in danger of further, if not total deterioration. <clears throat> How can it be salvaged or conserved? There's not much that can be done to the, the uh, about the cracking. What I would recommend is getting it into a sleeve or something that supports the, what's left of what's left of the layers, and so that you're not going to get any physical manipulation and further loss of the cracking. Um, so stabilizing the print, but then if you are interested in having those cracks um, become less visible, I'd recommend getting it digitized. And there are miraculous things that can be done with digital restoration so that you wouldn't really see those, those cracks. But to stabilize the physical um, print is a, is a good idea. Miles has shown us a daguerreotype. Um, this is a terrific daguerreotype, I love it. Um, one thing I wanted to point out was to see the little, let's see it particularly against the, the, the jacket, um, the little white spots. That's evidence of glass deterioration. <clears throat> so glass actually is deteriorates, believe it or not. And if you have it sealed in a package with the daguerreotype and the, the mat and the preserver, you get a microenvironment in there. And if it's ever lived in a humid environment, you're gonna get um, glass deterioration. It's very common. But the best thing to do is to, uh, is to have someone undo the package, clean the glass, and then rebind the, <clears throat> rebind the daguerreotype. That's best done by a conservator because the surface of the daguerreotype is extremely, extremely fragile. It's very easy to damage it. Um, so I, I wouldn't recommend doing that. The other thing that can be done with this to restore it to be actually a, a case that opens and closes is that you can repair the hinge um, so that it's, it's, it actually functions as like a little book again. And that's a, that's a common thing to do. So this one came in late um, and I haven't really had a chance to look at it. It was given a Xerox piece by a famous artist when assembled the creative lush piece and it was faxed. But since it was your honeymoon, you got a Xerox, which is good. It's been in a manila envelope all this time. Um, yes, um, I would recommend you actually find something to, to take it out of the manila envelope because that probably has acids in the, in the paper at this point. Purchase some acid-free, um, well, sheets are fine. It just depends on how big it is. Um, you might be able to find a, a, an envelope or a, um, a sleeve that's the right size. And then, yes, put it into an acid-free box. So basically, remove it from the materials in which you got it, update them, upgrade them, and I think you'll be fine. So this is the last one I got, and it's 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 um, quite condensed from from the converse. You know, somebody wrote in with a lot of information, but I distilled it down because basically what I'm going to say is this person has a number of questions, but most pressing is what is the best way to digitize all those prints? Apparently, Ricardo has many many prints, and so what I would say to that is tune in on August 5th <clears throat> because Tricia Patterson. Um, is going to address all those questions that you have. Um, and she is really going to, actually, I'm gonna take lots of notes on this one. And I'm sure she'll do a terrific job. 
I'll put the link back in the chat function, but we have more questions, Dana, if you, if we can hang around for about 15 more minutes. Absolutely. Um, Bobby Joe asks, so many of the color photographs my parents took in the 1950s are fading. Can they be repaired and how? I'm sure they printed them in the most expensive way possible. Um, well, from the 50s and 60s, um, did, they, did she say they were color prints? Yep, color photographs that have faded. faded. Is there any yeah. way to repair them? So the fading of those color dyes of the, of the three layers, the yellow, cyan, and magenta, you can't bring those back. Um, so whatever fading has happened has happened. Um, the only thing you can do is prevent it from happening by using cold storage. Um, something that we're looking into at the center for all of our color prints. Um, and, um, but there are, uh, with dig digital restoration services, there are um, specialists who will look at a print like that and work with what's still left and try to recreate um, a three color, you know, a three color print again. And I've seen very successful um, restoration jobs, but there's nothing to really to do to bring it back. The, the color printing, the color technology it, from the beginning was, was complicated and it wasn't until the 80s and 90s when the manufacturing companies really um, developed very stable die sets and then digital photography came along and blew it all up. So then uh, another question comes from Michelle. I have tons of 35 millimeter film that's been developed, still in the boxes from Ritz Camera and other companies. Are they better off in photo albums or kept in boxes since they're not in a humid area? What, what's the best way to store those? Well, I would take them out of the boxes or the materials that they came, they were, you know, that they came in because those materials aren't manufactured. To, to store materials long term. So be mindful of the materials you buy to store them in. Um, if they're 35 millimeter negatives, I would, um, you can put them in albums, but it's kind of hard to see that way. So either get them digitized and get them printed up or get someone to print them so that you have the, the positive images, put those into albums. Um, was there another part to that that I, um, no, I think that's that's the question. Um, oh, she has the photos too. So yeah, I, would, yeah. I would keep them separated, um, put them in good quality boxes, put them in a, in a very good, the best environment that you can in your house. And then the photos put in albums so that you can take them out and look at them when you want to, if, mm -hmm. if that suits. Donna asks, I, I have just acquired an enormous collection of family photographs from the late 1800s to the 2000s. Some of the negatives from the early mid part of the 20th century are slightly curled. How can I remedy that and store them, process, uh, store them properly? So you kind of talked about photographic prints. How, how do we deal with photographic negatives that have curled? Well, it depends on how curled. Um, if, if they're very, very, very curled, there are ways to flatten them. Um, and but flattening should be done by a conservator. Um, if they're not particularly harshly curled, you can get them into sleeves. And then what I have done is um, use a collection of them together to support each other to kind of encourage them to go back into plane, right? So it, it really depends on how curled they are. Um, but you can use their own, you know, their own pressure in a box um, to help to help keep them flat. Um, could you, uh, so Kayla asks, could you briefly talk about the process of cleaning a print? Well, sure. Um, cleaning it, depending on what's, what you're cleaning off. Um, if it's surface dirt, there are a number, of, you can use dry cleaning methods or wet cleaning methods, which includes uh, purified water and sometimes um, combinations of water and alcohol. It, de it really depends on what's actually soiling the, the print. Um, if there's an adhesive, that requires a slightly different strategy. Um, you have to know the solubility of what the adhesive is. Um, 
And, and one of the reasons why we like to identify photographs is because we can tailor the cleaning regime to the type of photograph it is. Say for instance, you have a, um, a 19th century collodion print, um, you're not gonna wanna use any alcohol in your water because it will actually dissolve the binder and then you've lost the image. Um, so that's a sort of a cautionary tale about, about cleaning. Um, but it really is very much tailored to what it is you're trying to clean off. Um, and, and that's part of what we study in, in conservation is to understand the various materials, not just what the photographs are, but what, what the dirt is. Mm. Um, we have one last question here. Again, it's about flattening prints that are curled um, because of long time uh, storage in a humid location. Yeah. And all kinds wow. of different variables. Yeah. <laughs> So the question is how to do it? Yeah. See a conservator? <laughs> Probably not. They might not have been asking the question, but I think um, my, my, my recommendation is really to, to consult with a conservator um, and have them talk you either through something. It, it is truly tailored to what the print looks like. I can't generically say um, this kind of photograph is going to flatten this way um, because there's so many variables and a lot of it will also depend on um, its storage condition, how curled it is, um, whether it's whether it's been affected by mold. If there's mold on the inside that's going to we want to use a very different protocol if there's been mold or if there's been something else that's happened to the print. So there's so many variables and so many ways in which things can go wrong. <clears throat> um, I would, I would really hesitate doing it unless consulting a conservator. So they, they should reach out to you. And again, um, what we're going to do is we are going to post this video in a number of days to our YouTube channel. So all of this fantastic information that Dana has presented will be able to be accessed later. And, and again, please reach out to Dana directly. Um, we placed your email in the chat and um, you can find us uh, all of our contact information on the center's website, ccp.arizona.edu. And the, the, some of the information I can send you is on how to find a conservator in your area. So for instance, if you're not in Tucson or you're not in Phoenix, um, you, you type in at the American Institute for Conservation, that's our national organization, there's a website and you can plug in your zip code and it will produce the names of conservators in your area um, that you can consult with. Well, Dana, thank you so very much. This was, this was wonderful. I always learn something having listened to it a couple times now, but it's just a treasure trove of, of advice and history and chemistry. Thank you so much for joining you're, us. You're welcome. My pleasure. It's been a lot of fun. Thank you all so much for tuning in and to our CCP members and Director Circle members. So thank you so very much. Check us out on um, August 5th. Uh, again, link is in the, in the chat, but also on our event page uh, on ccparizona.edu. But thank you all so much for joining us and have a lovely night. Bye now. <laughs>